Hello, 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 I'm Elder Fulmer Collins and uh, thank you for joining us for Cyber Bible Study. In this moment, we want to thank you for coming. Uh, gather your friends around, call somebody, tell them to tune in right now because we're going to be getting into God's Word. We want to thank you for to our Bishop, Bishop uh, Daryl J. McClary Sr. Uh, and our uh, Executive Pastor, Pastor Jessica T. McClary for allowing me uh, to once again come before you to get into God's Word. We just thank you for this opportunity and uh, we uh, just thank you for all of the uh, prayers and support of getting uh, together uh, on uh, this at this time uh, to get into God's Word. We just pray uh, that we are going to have a good time studying God's Word. So let us look to the Lord. Dear God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for the word that we're going to get into. Father, we ask you that you would now breathe fresh upon it, uh, that those who are listening uh, to this Bible study will get what you have just for them. Dear God, we thank you. Uh, claim the victory right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Elder Fulmer Collins, and we are here to get into God's word in this edition of New Light's Cyber Bible Study. Uh, we are in a, a season where we're going to be focusing on, on prayer and coming up in prayer. Uh, each of us as uh, Christians uh, uh, have a desire uh, to get deeper into our prayer life. And so we're going to just be picking up some things that we're going to talk about in coming up in our prayer life, coming up in prayer as a Christian. So uh, hold on. We're going to get right into the word. We're going to go to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Uh, the verses 43 through 45. Now, as we're talking about praying, uh, when we uh, pray, we're, we're, we're praying for the things that we, we need. We typically have a list of desires of our hearts. We're praying to God to, to, to bless us in certain ways, to bring us out, deliver us from certain things, uh, praying for our family, uh, those who are connected us, praying for our church, all of that. Uh, somewhat comes uh, easily and naturally because we are asking our Father to uh, bless us the way we see and the way we believe that we need. We also move into asking God to bless us the way he wants us to be blessed, which sometimes does not or necessarily doesn't coincide the way we think we, he, we ought to be blessed, but he blesses us nonetheless. Uh, we are uh, find ourselves maybe uh, with a sickness and we are praying for a healing or we are praying for uh, a breakthrough uh, on a job because we're looking for a promotion or we're looking for a breakthrough because we have an issue of life that we're dealing with, whether it be a spouse or a child or just a relationship or a co-worker that we're having difficulties with. We're praying for that situation to turn around. But in our, our text today, we're going to be talking about God's commandment, Jesus' commandment for us to pray for our enemies. And that, uh, and I'll be transparent, is a much more difficult uh, task that we ought to pray for our enemies. So let's get right into the word, uh, Matthew 5, verses 43 through 45, and I'm reading from the New International Version, and it's, it reads, Have you heard that it is said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy? But I tell you, this is Jesus talking, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of the father, your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now here we uh, find uh, Jesus in the uh, part of the Sermon on the Mount uh, where he's really talking about relationships, how we ought to treat each other. And in here he's talking about uh, loving our enemy and praying for those who persecute us. Well, the question we always have is, well, why should we pray for our enemy? And the short answer, if you grew up like I did, when your parent told you to do something uh, and you asked the question why, it was the answer that I normally got was because I said so. Now, we're not going to do you like that because Jesus tells us to pray for our, love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. And the short answer to why we should do it is because he said it. But we want to get into why does he say it? 
why does he really want us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us? So let's, let's, let, let's, let's take a look in God, to God's command for us praying uh, for those who persecute us. Uh, and we find right here in verse 45, because he commands us to do it, it says, and to pray for those who persecute you, that you may become, that you may be children of the Father in heaven. So we want to be more like our Father in heaven. We want to be more like his son, our Savior, Jesus. That as we develop and as we grow, we become more like Jesus. We want to be more like him because of all that he has put uh, into us. If you think about your parents, at least I'll think about, I'll talk to you about my uh, mother in, 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 in specifics. Uh, we desiring growing up uh, and my dad growing up, you want to be more like the people that you look up to. And we see the things of uh, the characteristics or the patterns, the behaviors of those that we look up to, and we want to be more like them. So in this sense, as Christians, we want to be more like Jesus because that is our example that is the example that God sent to us uh, in human form that we might have uh, the ability to look at how Jesus lived his life because that is our ultimate goal is to be more like Jesus it says also that uh, the reason why he's asking us to pray for our uh, enemies is he causes uh, and allows good and bad to happen to both evil uh, to good people and evil and so we being desiring to uh, be more like Christ, Christ loved us, not because of what we were or what we did or how we did it. He loved us because we were God's uh, creation. Uh, we are co-heirs with Christ. And so just like God created uh, us, he loves us, and because he loves us, he wants us again to be more like Christ, that Christ loves because that's who God is. God is love. And so everything that he does is out of love for his people. Now, how can we, the other reason why God wants us to pray for our enemies is because just like God was patient with us, we too as Christians need to be patient with those who despise us, those who persecute us, because at one time we were also enemies of God. Uh, we did not, had not given our lives to him, but he was patient with us. He was kind to us. And the scripture tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But even before we made the decision to accept Christ and love God the way he uh, needs to be loved the way he desires to be loved by his his creation by his children he already set in place the plan to reconcile us to him so while we have enemies who do all manner of thing against us and just as God is patient we need to be patient with those who persecute us those who despise us those who are our enemies and so uh, those are the things that we begin to think about when God asks us to pray for our enemies. And we say, well, why should I pray for this person? This person is doing things. They're talking about me. They're slandering my name. They're, they're going behind my back, trying to uh, sabotage what I uh, am trying to accomplish. Well, because God was patient with us, that same patient that he has for us, we need to also exhibit and show to those uh, who are around us. Uh, the last thing of uh, why we believe God wants us to uh, pray and love our enemies is because we are praying because we love them, because he loves us, and we need to pray for our enemies out of a uh, pure heart, out of a heart of love, and we must not pray without with, we must not pray with wrath and anger or bitterness but we should pray without those things as a first timothy 2 and 8 tells us therefore i want men everywhere to pray lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing so we as we approach praying for our enemies we need to do so 
without anger or malice uh, in our hearts or bitterness in our hearts. Uh, we touched on the things of why God uh, wants us to pray for our enemies. And when we begin to think about how are we going to pray for our enemies? What should I pray for? Are, I'm, am I praying for my enemy so I will be delivered from the hand? Am I praying for my enemy who is persecuting me because I want them to stop what they're doing? Or am I going to pray for my enemy and those who persecute me because I realize that they're also created by God? They have the same ability to receive Christ as I did. And so I am praying not that God would get them, uh, God would uh, uh, wave his hand and, and smite them, but what we should be praying as Christians when we are praying for our enemies is we should be praying for the same things that we pray for ourselves. When we look at the Lord's Prayer uh, and the disciples ask Jesus, uh, teach us how to pray or teach us to pray, he simply said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So same prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, the same things that we ought to be praying for our enemy. We should be praying for our enemies that they would first come and foremost come to hallow the name of God. That God is great, he's greatly to be praised, he is holy and that our enemies would come to know God just the way we do, that they would know and hallow his name. Often you will find people uh, taking the name of Jesus in vain, uh, using Jesus' name along with expletives, but we pray that our enemies and those who persecute us would give the name of God, the name of Jesus, the same reverence that we do. That uh, we should also pray that our enemy come under the saving grace of God uh, through Jesus Christ. Uh, the second verse of the Lord's Prayer is this, your kingdom come, your will be done, that our enemies will realize that they desire for God's kingdom to come and that his will would be done. That no matter what their plot or their scheme is against it, we pray that their heart would be changed, that they will desire they will yearn for God's will to be done and for his kingdom to come. Now also we pray that our enemy would do the will of God. Each of us uh, having given our lives to Christ uh, have an assignment and by praying for our enemies one to hallow the name of God that we would uh, come under God's uh, will for our lives that they would be one, they desire, they would yearn, they would be willing to do the will of God in their lives. Each of us has our own assignment. And so we pray not that our enemy would take up the mantle that we have, but whatever God has for them, we pray that they would accept God's will for their life and then begin to execute what God has for them. We also uh, want to pray that our enemy's needs are met the resources that we desire for ourselves, we pray out of a pure heart that God would supply the resources of our enemies. And we have to come to understand that our enemies are not necessarily the person that we are focused on, but uh, our enemies are those who do not love God and who are not willing to submit their lives to, to Christ. And so we want to know that our enemies, if we pray for our enemies to hallow the name of the Lord, uh, that they would come under the saving uh, grace and will of our God, and they would be willing to do the will of God in their lives. And we pray that God would supply all of their needs according to his riches, because we 
actually are desiring our enemies to accept Christ, to be saved and become members of the family of God. We should pray also that uh, their sins would be forgiven and they would in turn be a forgiving person. Just as Christ uh, in the scripture in Ephesians 4 and 32, that we are, we are commanded, we are uh, directed to be kind one to another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. So we want to not only have our enemies' sins forgiven, but we want them to, by the power of the Holy Ghost, to be turned into forgiving uh, people, just as we are forgiving people as commanded by Scripture. And finally, we pray that God would protect them from the temptation and the destructive powers of the devil. Now that's something that we typically don't even think about when we are thinking about our enemy. Again, I say we think about our enemies typically that we want them removed. We want them removed from and to, for them try, trying to thwart our, our progress. Uh, we want them removed for trying to uh, ruin us because truly the real enemy in all of this is Satan and he has but one, but one job description that is to kill steal and destroy and he uses people to make that happen but we ultimately know that satan is defeated our enemies are defeated and but we do desire for the humans who are doing the things that they might be doing that they ultimately would be saved by the grace of god and we pray constantly that our enemies would be saved as we've outlined here that they would hallow the name of God. We want, we talk about Christians making disciples. And so making disciples, what better place to make a disciple is those who have persecuted you, showing them the difference God can make in their lives. But it first starts with prayer because if you walk up to your enemy who's trying to do the things that they're doing against you, they may not be willing to hear. But if we pray, if we pray out of a pure heart to God, please change this person. Change them so they would become more like you. We will be surprised because we know that in all things, all things work together for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So if we are praying for our enemy to be saved, sometimes we don't have to worry about what they're doing because once they have accepted Christ, all those things will go away. The old man has gone and the new man has come. So we need to be earnest about praying for our enemies. What better compelling example of that than Christ on the cross? Christ on the cross after being tried, found innocent actually, but when they asked who would we have me crucify, they yelled, crucify him. They hung him on the cross. And what does he say? He prays for his enemies. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23 and 34. That is the ultimate example, the most compelling example of praying for our enemies. And Christ is our example, and that's the example we can follow. Facing death, his first idea was to pray for those who had hung him on the cross because they did not know what they were actually doing. What they were actually doing was setting up to change the world forever. What the devil meant for, for harm, God turns it around and means it for good. And because he prayed for his enemies to forgive them for they know not what they do, ushered in a forgiveness that Christ brought from the cross that once his blood was shed once he died was buried and rose again he sits there interceding for us at the right hand of God the Father and because of his shed blood we can be forgiven we have been forgiven and our prayer is that our enemies will come under the same loving saving grace that God provides through the work on the cross so we just want to encourage you to be strong in the Lord and pray for those who mistreat us and who persecute us because it is not an option, it is a command of God. God bless you, until the next time.